Welcome to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast, hosted by Peter O'Toole, sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. Today on The Microscopists. Today on The Microscopists, I'm joined by Mark Ellisman of UCSD, and we discuss his early ambitions. So you might say I, uh, in my early years, the most interesting thing to me was to make a chop shop for bicycles. The importance of generosity in scientific collaboration. That no single investigator should receive so much money to have all of that stuff to themselves. The pros and cons of deep learning. The deep learning is sort of easier to uh, to test with regard to accuracy on test data sets. The problem is the expense of computing. And his advice to early career scientists. For the those who, who want to avoid feeling like they're in competition all the time, try and ask questions that are legitimate, but two steps beyond everybody around you. Or in this episode of The Microscopist. Hi, and welcome to this episode of The Microscopist. I'm Peter O'Toole from the University of York, and today I'm joined by Mark Ellisman from the National Center of Microscopy and Imaging Research at UC San Diego. Mark, how are you today? I'm well, I'm well. Enjoying nice weather here in California. I hope you're doing the same, Peter. Uh, it's okay today. Uh, and that's very, uh, for British, that's really positive if I say it's okay. <laughs> 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 so, so, Mark, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I haven't asked this as a first question. What was the first microscope you ever used? Can you remember which microscope it was? What type? Um, since I started out doing electrophysiology, I think the first microscope I probably used was a compound microscope, bright field, light microscope, the type, who knows, but it probably was uh, American optical or something very simple. And I, I remember my first experience. Did you actually like the microscope that you used? <laughs> Peter, I don't want to extend this, but like is a hard uh, question in the sense of, uh, it was extremely simple. There was not much more than brass and glass. Yeah. And uh, a light source, uh, if I remember correctly, with a cord that needed repair. Uh, I was not a microscopist when I uh, started out being curious about biology. Uh, so that was not the centerpiece of my activity. Uh, the microscope no, think, was more uh, interesting to me. I, I don't think that's uncommon. I think so many people who recognize the microscopy or the use or the development of microscopy never started with an interest in, in the microscope. It was a, they, they found their way into it. So what was your, actually, what did you want to be as a child when you grew up? Well, um, I come from uh, a family with a father with a very strong engineering background. He was an aerospace engineer, a nuclear engineer. And so uh, from the time I was very small, I fiddled with my father in the workshop. Uh, and he taught me a lot of, how would you say, how to make things and some of the principles of uh, materials and physics. And so I spent time making bicycles or making go-karts, eventually making vehicles of different sorts, uh, trying to, how would you say, manufacture with his tutelage, those piece parts that made them unique. So you might say I, uh, in my early years, the most interesting thing to me was to make a chop shop for bicycles. So, so do you see you, when you were a child, do you think that's what I'd like to do when I, when I grow up? And 
No, I just figured that that was something I enjoyed, the small accomplishments of making something on the weekend or having little construction projects. And I think I realized that that gave me joy, the kind of interval accomplishments of making something. And when I expanded, uh, I would just say my thinking to be curious about things like the brain, I decided that I would use what seemed to be a talent for using my hands and my head to make stuff to try and have at least a little piece of what I did as a scientist involve making things because that would give me kind of short term sense of, you know, sense of accomplishment in the short term, whereas the bigger questions were quite, uh, to get answers to big questions was a lengthy business with lots of hills and valleys on the way. And I thought I needed a little bit of a day-to-day -day sense of accomplishment. And I thought that would come from making the parts to enable the science. Okay. So, so, so what got you into the science to start with? Because obviously your degree was in science, then you went on to your PhD, I think at Colorado. Uh, what, what trick more what complicated you Peter, the, uh, I, I did my uh, completed my undergraduate work at Berkeley in the late 60s, which was a bit of a heady time with uh, you know protests and uh, uh, everything you heard about the 60s. I know you're probably just a little bit younger than me uh, are true. Okay especially if you happen to live in the San Francisco Bay Area at that time. So I would say that uh, I went to college wondering how the brain worked, being impressed by you know, discoveries that I listened to uh, about on the radio, like you know, Watson and Crick's breakthrough, you know, which was told very nicely by the expose of the double helix or whatever, which was reading at the time, I guess I was in junior high school. And I decided that uh, the brain would provide a uh, sandbox, if you like, for exploration for a lifetime or more. And that uh, there would be discoveries if one could put together strategies that would help me to understand, you know, with my kind of 60s curiosity, what was actually going on in my head, why I was me, why uh, I reacted uh, in different ways, what was perception, you know, we were all curious about uh, what an individual's perception was and how fixated it was by the chemistry at the moment. I, I, I just love the thought that, so obviously you went into neuroscience and bioengineering and part of your drive is when you're actually developing the tools, you're developing the tools, you see a result, you get excited, and then you want to see what's going on in your brain, what's causing you to get excited, which drives your next project. Obviously you can't do your own brain. Uh, I, I, guess that'd be, I, I guess that'd be a no brainer at that point if you were to try uh, yeah. that. <laughs> There are a few who would like to donate their brain to get their wiring in the interest of their own immortality. I have had those conversations. The, um, I'm not one who thinks that's the way to immortality. I, I think one, one needs out of this at some point. So immortality is not exactly my goal. The, um, I think that the stories, and I don't want to make a long answer because we have a limited amount of time, but it's kind of interesting. Um, when I was at Berkeley, uh, I completed my uh, requirements for my undergraduate degree a little early. Uh, and I was uh, given the opportunity to do some what were called honors activities, which are graduate courses. And uh, I had been working on animal behavior uh, in one of the labs looking at how different species of animals could respond with different levels of complexity in their response to something novel in their environment. 
And then you asked me what was my first microscope. Well, the first microscope was what I had to use to analyze the circuits at a very primitive level in the brains of animals that could manipulate things greatly that were novel in their environment versus ones that you yeah. know, were more sloth-like and having almost no interest in anything that was novel unless they could eat it. And uh, so that kind of led me to think that there were other ways besides just cutting up the and looking at the dead fixed anatomy to monitor. And I took a course uh, from actually Horace Barlow, who's uh, famous in the UK. I think Horace is probably still among us, but rather old. Uh, where there were just six of us and we learned the classic physiology from cats to rodents or whatever, a Hubel and weasel type physiology. So a lot with primitive electrodes. Remember this is 1969 or something like that. And I was impressed. And then I actually sought to go to graduate school to work as a physiologist with electrodes and look at subtle aspects of the nervous system. So what I asked at, in my first graduate, in my first PhD program, I had two PhD programs at Colorado that I joined sequentially. The first one was to ask, if you look at a neuron that fires very reliably when it's asked to, like a motor neuron to move your leg muscles, how does it differ in its channel behavior, like sodium channel behavior, yep. calcium channel behavior, from a neuron that actually changes its probability of responding if it's been activated previously. So this was at that time kind of one of those holy uh, grail questions about, you know, where does plasticity reside? There's interest in, you know, whether it's at a synapse, the chemical places where yeah. one cell spits a neurotransmitter or another with a delay of a couple of milliseconds. The next stage of how neurons work is that activity with the chemistry of the synapse results in a change in the potential across the membrane, and then it fires off an action potential and the signal goes a very long distance. But that's not a highly reliable process. So I was really curious about why some neurons, right next to other neurons, hold reliability and others hold plasticity or you know the yeah. change. And so I worked on that at the wrote software programs, used microelectrodes, had pretty much outlined a complete thesis on that topic as a intracellular physiologist in the very early days of sharp electrodes. And I decided that looking at the abstraction of oscilloscopes or reading out graphs and charts as you would as sort of a physical sciences oriented person using analytics aided by computers, was one or two levels of abstraction beyond where I thought I would benefit the most. And there was a summer course offered in electron microscopy by the department next door. I was already pretty far along in finishing my PhD. So I asked my advisor if I could go take the course because I wanted to look at that part of the neuron and see if I could see anything there that would give me a, a charge mentally as to what I might ask that's different from what we've been asking with the abstraction of a microelectro. Um, problem, the problem arose, the course had a fee. My advisor had no money. So being, uh, I guess, a bit uh, of a high energy kind of guy at that time, I've calmed down a lot. I approached the course coordinator, the chairman of the department, who I didn't know was a famous person, just knew he was the gatekeeper for the course. His name was Keith Porter. And I, I went and had a meeting with him to ask if I could get into the course for free. 
you know, because I couldn't pay the fee unless I paid it yeah. out of my pocket. And that meeting was rather remarkable because I told Porter what I wanted to do. And it turned out that we could serve each other's purposes. He needed someone who was energetic and curious to try and use a microscope that he had just procured that was 1 million volts, so three stories tall. And he'd promised uh, someone who'd given him a, a, a fellowship to award to somebody, a guy by the name of Ernest Fulham, Ernie Fulham, who was with Porter at the Rockefeller. Fulham made the first grid when Porter developed the microtome. So he didn't know who to give the Fulham Fellowship to, and the Fulham Fellowship was for neuroscience. And he hadn't had a neuroscientist come. So he said, well, how are you being supported, young Ellisman? Would you like a fellowship? And I'd been doing teaching assistant work at that point for three years, which was a bit of a grind. So I said, sure, and uh, that was exciting. Of course, what Porter had in mind was that I would leave the department I was in and come and do a PhD with him. So he was like, you know, he yep. put the paid out and had, had hooked me, which was good. Turned out that the million volt microscope was not very uh, practical. We couldn't figure out how to stain immediately. And it didn't get me closer to my channels. But down the corridor from the Porter's, Porter lab was a guy by the name of Andrew Stalen, who was one of the early people doing freeze fracture, which had the promise of revealing uh, membrane proteins. I mean, it had revealed membrane proteins and channels. And since I was uh, taught to look at the voltage dependent sodium channel, which we knew was a channel, but nobody purified it or seen it. I thought I could at least hunt for the sites where we knew it was concentrated by electrophysiology. So while I was waiting for some help to figure out how to use a high voltage microscope and get contrast because 1 million volt electrons really don't leave much trail to give you scattering contrast. Uh, I went and learned freeze fracture and then did freeze fracture on systems that exhibit plasticity. So Eventually we figured out how to use the million volt. And so that's another story we can get to. So you were very fortunate, well, I, I guess very fortunate that that opportunity arose. And then uh, if we fast forward to your recent work, it's not just the electron microscope, it's the combination of, all, of most of microscopies, light microscopy, electron microscopy, X-ray microscopy, really to study not the same question, but to just dive deeper and understand. And it's still sort of the same question though, isn't it? It's still trying to understand the basics of, of the brain and the neuronal system. You well, have or I, no, I, I, Peter, I don't wanna to be too, corrective, but the brain has been my passion and the diversity of microscopies that I've managed to drag in to at least have available to, to look sometimes at the same question is because most questions uh, are multi-scale, yep. uh, not only in dimensional terms, but in time. And so if you're looking at a channel uh, with a microelectrode and the abstract signal that you see, you're looking in time domains of milliseconds or fractions thereof, because that's the cadence of their behavior or their yep. dy dynamism. More aggregate properties that would happen with, let's say, a thousand channels or receptors or something in a small patch of membrane, let's say, a, micron, which is easily, a micron domain is easily seen with a light microscope, but channels that are 10 nanometers in diameter are not, right? Directly visible with the light microscope. So you need to merge all of these things to try and get some time domain, some uh, grounding, 
And um, each one of the microscopies that we brought in to you know, have available at the National Center or we link to where we can't you know, field, let's say a multi-ion mass spec, uh, we haven't harvested enough money to have one of those of our own. We use in combination on the same problem Okay. But the, the key to, I think, the success of the center has been really twofold. One is articulating uh, a very simple kind of mantra, and that's that uh, if you combine frontier activities in chemistry, let's say chemistry of labeling, how you how you mark something for different modalities, light or electron microscopy, with uh, engineering or instrument development. So again, going back to what I said earlier about engineering, always feeling gratified for making a better bicycle wheel or, or whatever. If I could spend a little bit of time satisfying my amateur engineer niche, right? Learn enough physics to know something about electron optics and camera technology. I mean, we made a lot of cameras, including the direct detector, you know, at the center. So engineering, so chemistry, engineering. And then the part that I also learned from just using early computers down, all, you know, all the way back to punch cards at Berkeley, was that you need to put some math and analytics behind it because you have to turn what's otherwise likely to be an observational science into something where you can put numbers on top of the data and potentially pitch to people that are braver than me who do simulations to determine from simulations or predictions which direction to take the next experimental science. So that's kind of been the, the how would you say, the, the way I built the legs on the stool that have held up the center, combined with the realization that no single investigator should receive so much money to have all of that stuff to themselves. And so the only way that I could build a center with you know, $70 million worth of current hardware you know, from time to time was to make sure that we were generous in collaborating with a worldwide community to, uh, how would you say, justify very expensive tools, keeping them current. Uh, that's, that's been the, our mantra, even though there have been some themes of science. So I, I was gonna say, you talked about making engineering, but you've also been involved in the manufacture of the tools. You know, if we think mini sog and some of the other bits so and part of those are through collaborations you know you've had to be there to to be at the forefront of a lot of the field a lot of the time and that's quite a talent actually you 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 know you said you've got 70 million dollars worth of equipment but that doesn't come by luck that comes by you know having those collaborations making it worthwhile giving the impact back to science as well now how how have you found that as a challenge that's quite challenging to keep at the forefront for so long you know you, you must have a, a a great team that's been under you to, to help support that because you know as a lead person you then have to have people to to enact an action and, and become you know to, to really enable so much how, how how have you balanced that well the first thing is to realize that um, you're only as good as the smarter people around you. And um, that it's not just the politics of how you pitch to raise money, where, you know, you, you don't go in with a crown with a bunch of, uh, you know, beach rocks, you go in, you know, with an enterprise or a crown that has shiny jewels, people that are highly regarded and viewed as reliable. Now, I've been extremely lucky in that e even though I'm probably not uh, 
in in many of these collaborations, the I would just say the the smartest one in the room by a long shot that I've been able to be friends and collaborate with people that were absolutely brilliant. Roger Chan being one of them. We hit it off when Roger came to UCSD, uh, both of us liking to make things, Roger being a brilliant chemist and uh, having, uh, you know, maybe we taught each other a few things. I learned a lot more from Roger than I think he learned from me but one part of it was uh, me influencing Roger uh, about the value of going from uh, light, kind of the miracle of light, yeah. as some in platonics say, to how we would turn the uh, signal that you get from some dynamic probe. I mean, his most important work were calcium indicators. He got the Nobel Prize for the fluorescent proteins, but all of us were going. Here's another example where the most important work was left on the table with regard to the Nobel Committee. But how we started a project to try and figure out how to make uh, probes that would show when one of his calcium indicators, one of the non-genetic ones before GFP, was with calcium versus when it was without calcium. My lab, you know, and John Singer, who was a collaborator in the early days of the lab, he helped me start NICMR, Singer of the fluid mosaic membrane legacy. We were doing a lot with antibodies. Uh, and Tokiasu was part of the team. Uh, he was the one who developed uh, Suprasymbetic cryosectioning and immunolabeling. So Roger had the idea that we would make monoclonal antibodies together that would recognize one of the calcium indicators with calcium, without calcium, differentiate. And so we could follow up an EM places that had calcium transients would then be marked at higher resolution. I was skeptical. I'm not afraid to, in the presence of greatness, to say, well, maybe not. Uh, tell me, tell me uh, I'm wrong. I said, Roger, you know, if we do the antibody stuff, it's not going to be as pretty as we'd like because you have to permeabilize to get these immunoglobulins in, you know, they're 10 nanometer complexes. And so the pristine ultrastructure won't be there. We might be better than light microscopy, but, you know, it might be ugly. I said, why don't we think about photooxidation? Let's use you know, one of your molecules or some derivative thereof to generate reactive oxygen. And I think that reactive oxygen, we can control the chemistry. You tell me, you're the expert, Roger. So that the paint that we put on, the encasement, which is electron dense by you know, one or another trick we figured out, would be you know, like a five nanometer shell kind of like negative staining in situ. I said that might work better because then all the reactants are small molecules. Roger initially, you know, uh, like any brilliant person liked his own idea first, right? So he, he said, well, that could be really muddy, right? And I said, well, Roger, let me try it. Okay, help me here. I said, you know, I've worked a lot with the acetylcholine receptor. I had uh, worked with purified receptor with John Lindstrom and Mike Raftery, and we characterized the receptor in negative stain and reconstituted it. This is stuff that I did when I arrived at UCSD in, I think, 1978, 79. I said, why don't we just use bungrotoxin, which binds irreversibly to two of the subunits in the nicotinic receptor. And let's put a fluorophore on it, you know, just by, you know, direct conjugation that will generate reactive oxygen. And he, he said, okay, so just use tetrabromofluorescine. And I said, oh, okay, well, I know about fluorescein. What's tetrabromo? 
and he laughed at me like I was his dumber younger brother is, you know, he said, it's Eason, right? And I said, oh, Eason, I know Eason. So we made those conjugates or I had molecular probes do it. And then what I was able to show at the neuromuscular junction, which I had studied well as a graduate student, was that I could make the acetylcholine receptors stand out as individual molecules in a thin section. So by painting yep. the pore, I had done what I'd suggested to Roger we might be able to do was do an encasement staining of the molecule and count. What was, his, what was his take on it when he saw it, this muddy image that he was expecting? It was, okay, we'll make probes that are reactive oxygen generators. So you proved okay. the point. So we, we shifted from the antibody stuff and... Uh, to uh, reactive oxygen generators. Uh, first, a series that were, you know, related to, uh, you know, no complex uh, molecular biology. And then once the multiple colors of GFP came around, we shifted to look for other uh, expressible molecules like Minisog ultimately, which was based on uh, something from, uh, uh, phototropin two, um, and and so we're kind of off to the races. It's still more complicated to do those things than it is to use an enzyme like the uh, apex that uh, we co-developed with Alice Ting. But the apex generates a fulminating reaction and will be more muddy. The photooxidation is still probably the best in terms of a high fidelity localized stain. It's just that it's harder to disseminate because you have to train people to do it right. So I'm gonna switch track a second. Okay. You have, if, if anyone, so those who are listening, you should actually just tune in just to see Mark's background because <laughs> if I could have that picture on my wall as a big picture, I would, it is. And just the, just the colors that are chosen are beautiful. And you sent me some other pictures as well. So, uh, so, Again, these are all uh, confocal images. Right. If I'm not mistaken. But then you also sent me some of the volume EM. Yeah. Yeah. This is from what we call the Denkatome, the one you're behind now. That image uh, is of the cerebellum, and that's the largest cell body in the brain called the Purkinje cell. And in the background, in the kind of binarized uh, grayscale, uh, is the rest of the volume imaging data. But just sitting on top of it, that I guess it's a, I'm a little color deficient. It's a orangey red hairball. Those are deep learning based segmentation of all the mitochondria, and uh, that's from uh, a project a fellow in the laboratory, Matthias Haberle, who's now in Berlin. Did. We developed a lot of deep learning algorithms to map subcellular organelles going back now 10 years. Something Genalia has taken up in high uh, energy lately, uh, and we're happy to use their tools. Uh, our tools are publicly available. The one on the right uh, behind me, sorry, is uh, like the one that you had up behind you, uh, which is a confocal image. There you go. So in the early days of confocal microscopy, I think we convinced BioRed to loan us a machine as they were in development so that uh, as is common, they could, in those days, they were the only ones fielding the MRC uh, yep. output, which came from uh, Sidney Brenner's lab, essentially, uh, when they were trying to do mapping of C. elegans. Uh, they did serial section EM, as you know, but they also were trying to figure out how to make the light microscope work better. So we had one of those tools very early and we used our capability uh, from just standard epifluorescence work we'd done before that to do multiple uh, labeling, multiple antibody labeling. So the one on the left is antibodies and non-antibody staining again of the cerebellum, the Purkinje cells are oriented the wrong way that for proper convention, it should be flipped upside down, but that's not, uh, it looks better this way. It looks kind of like uh, 
how would you say radishes rooting or something. The one on the right is looking from uh, the vitreous, so looking through the lens of the eye, not really, it's just looking at the surface, the inner surface of the retina. And the blue canals are the vessels. The green stars are astrocytes. The pebbles, which look like peas on your plate, those are the cell bodies of the retinal ganglion cells, of which there are about 20,000. Uh, and the red uh, uh, tracks, those are the axons of the ganglion cells streaking across the retina, all trying to get to the exit point in the optic nerve. Those are stained with neurofilament. I just like these because they're colorful. And uh, since, uh, how would you say, I've always stuck up for the non-neuronal cells, the glia. At least this was one image that I like to show has glia. Uh, they are visually Partially very striking. striking. Sorry? They are visually very striking. Yeah. And yeah. just finally, because you sent me this other image as well, which is... Yeah, this one is more recent and published. Well, maybe it is published in a paper um, that uh, one of the fellows in, in my lab, one of the uh, scientists, uh, 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 Matthew Madeney uh, did, again, extending the deep learning-based segmentation. Uh, in this case, it's again the cerebellum, uh, the red things that look like uh, uh, you know, red uh, grass, those are the parallel fibers. And then you see the mitochondria in the... Uh, dendrites of the Purkinje cells streaking across the top of the grass there. Uh, so again, this is using deep learning based segmentation at a, a higher, uh, how would you say, a lower resolution, larger field of view to map subcellular features in the context of connectomics. Um, so that, again, just as I explained, this is the kind of merging of, you know, chemistry of labeling, pushing instruments along and then having ways of turning complex scenes into something that you can actually uh, rock in some useful way once you look at it. And it is that, I, I think that, as you said, the, the deep learning uh, to, to, to do that auto segmentation and to do it. And, and this, it's amazing how fast that's come on. I mean, if we go back, I don't know, I can't remember the first time I met you, it was taking weeks, months, to segment an image. Right, um, usually somebody who gets very strong arms from tracing. <laughs> and, and now, you know, it, it is getting better. The auto segmentation, the, the deep learning is getting better. It's still not, how good would you say the, that is now compared to still going manual? Um, well, manually you can never do enough to, uh, to, to really, you know, bear on an important question, I think, except something very kind of a toy problem. Yep. So I think you have to, unless you have a team of tracers as we did 10, 15 years ago, where we, you know, get students. And then you have to, you know, make sure before you launch on something that is unknown, that they all produce an adequate level of reliability on something that is known. The deep learning is sort of easier to, uh, to test with regard to accuracy on test data sets. The problem is the expense of computing because there's uh, the learning phase, which can be computationally uh, expensive. Yeah. And then there's the actual turning loose the ultimately trained uh, algorithm on a big enough data set. Uh, so, how practical is it in terms of, I mean, your key question there was, uh, you know, what's the criteria for uh, having a reliable enough surface? I'm translating it to make numbers that are meaningful. Peter, you know, it's going to depend on the question, right? And Good answer. If, if you're, if you're trying, I mean, I, you know, let me segue this to another kind of, you know, where, where we are right now as microscopists. There's been a real boom in the, uh, how would you say, I call it nat nativist microscopy, uh, cryo-EM, where, 
the rally cry is, and I don't mean to get in trouble, that uh, if it isn't in cryo, it isn't true, right? That the only way that you're seeing something which is believable is if it's based on the inherent uh, difference in the way electrons interact with the atoms that nature has pushed together versus water. <clears throat> And if you're looking at something with stain or you know, enhanced contrast with metals as has been the stock and trade in most uh, STEM or TEM or block face imaging, SEM, uh, you're somehow removed from reality by some uh, artifact of fixation or embedding or staining. I prefer to think that the structural biology world is enhanced significantly by cryo and that we'll learn more about you know the folds and the atoms and this sort of thing but that leaves a big gap in uh, what i call the meso scale on up and so if you address your question from the standpoint of what level of detail is going to make a difference for the question. If it's wiring of the nervous system, local wiring, plasticity that occurs minute to minute, hour to hour, circadian or estrous cycle or some slow, slower cycle, aging would be a good one. You don't need to use cryo-EM to validate the dimensions you need something that's going to give you enough samples with high enough throughput at you know not molecular or atomic resolution but at cellular resolution and you simply no. need to determine the difference between pristine cryo structure in a region of interest and what you get as a consequence of all of the preparative methods and the truth is, if you read the literature, there's not much difference if you fix well, high pressure freeze, free substitute. The dimensions are largely the same as cryo. I, I, don't, I don't think you've done a disservice to the cryo EM community. I, I think they are looking at different challenges as well. And, and just like arguably, therefore, an electron microscopist would say that light microscopy is utterly useless especially when you look at the fixation processes and everything else. And obviously they all have a place uh, in the world of, of getting higher and higher resolution. And it's the resolution you need to see to answer the question that we're probably aiming at. And I think that's what you're alluding to. Essentially, you don't need that cryo-EM ultimate resolution compared to what you can do with a fixed. And it's very hard to do that kind of... Uh high resolution work on a sample that comes from an animal's organ. It's great for isolated molecules or something in culture, potentially maybe some slice preps that are uh, uh, hypoxia tolerant. But for right now, we know, we still know how to take tissues from animals uh, and have them pretty much in the same state they were when the animal was thinking breathing, whatever, uh, and do uh, 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 metallization. The, you may know um, NICMR from its very inception uh, in the late 80s wanted to move away from film. And so I spent a lot of time building high quality cameras with CCD devices that were 90% quantum efficient and lenses because I realized that film was great, but going to be too slow. And if you wanted to make a microscope that had, that was a, how would you say, a smart peripheral device, which we did back at that time, that you could either run remotely or have in a feedback loop to self-correct, you needed a high quality camera and you needed it to be fast. And ultimately you needed it to replace film in terms of the pixel count and the dynamic range. So we sought to do that and we did it. They were expensive. And eventually we shifted to the uh, risky notion that we could get rid of the scintillator and have direct bombardment detectors work. 
So we went out on a limb 20 years ago and started and got raised money. We even had, you know, the patent. We, we invented the direct detector. I mean, we use technology from efforts at the Large Hadron Collider. And then we, we manufactured radiation hardened CMOS devices. Uh, that wasn't, we didn't do that because we intended to fuel the cryo -EM community, which we did. Right, that was a real enabler. Yeah, for which we're credited, even in the Nobel Prize for that activity. It was because I wanted high throughput, high fidelity, for uh, you know work in general. Uh, now we're up to an 8K by 8K detector. We have analytics on the same detector, so I still think there's room to grow, and there's important. There's in, it's important to continue to remain competitive, and serve more than just the cryo community. We use those detectors in STEM, which is really interesting. You coming from more of the physics can imagine, you can use a, a pixelated detector, just like you'd use multi-annular uh, detectors in dark field, and simultaneously pick up different elements, right? At least you, you're not going to analyze them like we do in energy loss. But if you only have a few elements that give you different radii in, in STEM, you know, with the right angular capabilities in the platform. Uh, so I think there's a lot of room to grow electron microscopes. And, you know, I'm blathering a little bit, but one of my frustrations has always been, you know, having learned enough about electron optics to be dangerous that we're still working with electron optics that are pretty close to Ruska's design. Yeah. And uh, if you really wanted to build a microscope that was ideal for a transmission electron microscope, you'd actually have the optical plan be a bit different. And- uh, It's a big investment, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you'd use a Lorenz microscope to be, you know, where the, the the specimen was not in the immersion field of the objective, for one. But, but anyway, I think that there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, it's just that it's cash. Uh, uh, even though there's a lot of investment in science, uh, microscope companies are driven by market. So to actually go back to you know, some fundamentals and come up with an alternative microscope column design uh, usually exceeds the interest of the major manufacturers. Yeah, it's a long-term development punt, I guess. But there is, I think, even without going back to that, there's a lot coming. There's a lot in the background going on in the R&D side at the moment. That Absolutely. Yeah. It's going to be a lot of excitement coming forward. I'd like to ask you some quick-fire questions, Mark. So, Are you a PC or a Mac person? Um, at least for home and my own work, I'm a Mac person. The laboratory is quite mixed, and we were, uh, you know, Vax VMS shifted to Unix ahead of most people back okay. in the day. So um, we've been pretty ag agnostic, but uh, uh, so we like bird. open source tools. <laughs> Are you an early bird <laughs> or an night owl? At this point in my life, I, I am an early bird. Uh, and, okay. uh, and get I, up in the morning. I think the more sleep you get, the better. And that's because of the work I do in Alzheimer's disease. Okay. Get your sleep. That's good advice. I probably might need a bit more. Tea or coffee? Coffee. Beer or wine? Uh, very little wine. Uh, single malt, but less than I used to. Okay. Chocolate. Did you hear chocolate? that, Connor? Single malt. Yeah. Single malt. Okay. Uh, what's your okay? What's your favorite brand? Go on, plug it. Uh, Smoky Dirty. Okay. So I mean something uh, all, a little more exotic than Lagavulin, but that's. <laughs> Uh, this is yeah. from having been on a board reviewing the computer science in Edinburgh twice a year for the better part of a decade. Lagavellin. You must yeah. have had Lagavellin. That is so... Oh, anyway, chocolate or cheese? Cheese. Ooh, okay. And what's your favourite food? If you're going to a conference and someone was taking you out, 
what would be the best food that they could serve in front of you? Well, in the right season in, you know, Belgium or Germany, it would be yeah, white it's asparagus. Bad. Asparagus. And actually, I, I, I've eaten in Belgium with you and they it was white asparagus season when we were there. I yeah, think was... I think they, we might have been in that same uh, convent or whatever. And uh... That was uh, with Chris Gavin, wasn't it? I think. Right. Uh, That's organized it. And it was uh, actually, was it? It might have been Elmi in Leuven. Yeah, actually. I think it was. Yeah, it was. And I, I remember the asparagus being shown before they cooked it on the on the wood that they were cooking it on. Uh, that was quite. What is your what is what is your worst? What do you least like food wise? Is there anything you really dislike food wise? <laughs> Uh, no, I'm pretty uh, omnivorous. Okay, see, 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 I really don't like seafood and shrimps, and on that same meal, one of the courses was shrimps. <laughs> it's like, oh, really? <laughs> it got from this to this. But anyway, I, hopefully Chris won't listen or watch this to realise I really found the shrimps quite difficult to eat. Uh, what, what about... Uh, do you, what do you do? Uh, do, you, do you watch TV? Would you rather read a book or watch TV? Um most of my reading is outside of um, my main interest. Uh, I have scientific hobbies uh, or um, I spend a lot of time uh, uh, since I've been 19 months here in our little castle. Uh, how would you say I've been doing most of the maintenance here. So okay. I, I read, how would you say, I listen to a lot of YouTubes on how to uh, uh, deal with stuff but in terms of what i watch i, th I would say that uh, mary and i spend more time looking at uh, documentaries or uh, nova or uh, you know I've, I've, I've quite a hobby in marine microbial ecology these days so i read in that area okay origin of the eukaryotic cell is a fascination that I, I, I won't, I, I presume there's no trashy TV, a secret vice in the, I, I remember talking to Richard Henderson and he mentioned Breaking Bad is what he got into actually over lockdown. It's his big thing. Uh, <laughs> I can see Richard Breaking Bad at some point. But... <laughs> <laughs> He's a chemist arguably, I guess. <laughs> yeah. that way. Uh, I mean, if he went to cell biology, that would be Breaking Bad for him. <laughs> yes, let's not get into Bible there. Uh... <laughs> Bible, Bible, yeah, yeah, let's not go there. Uh, I would ask you what your favorite movie is. But what I'm going to ask you, I'm not going to second guess it. What's your favorite movie? Um, prob probably, de de depending on, uh, it would be something like Citizen Kane for the cinematography. Okay. Uh, everybody loves that movie. Uh, uh, if you're old enough to have probably watched it and, uh, I mean, there are plenty of movies that I would uh, watch as an uplifting since I've been chasing gophers around the yard. It could be Caddyshack for... Yeah, yeah. But, uh, is that John Candy, was it? Is that John Candy and Caddyshack? I think he was, but uh, it was... Uh, I, I, any, anyway, the star was the gopher. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I... I um, I should have asked, what's your trashy movie? But there you go. You just give me your trashy movie rather than trashy TV. I, uh, I'm more into to comedy than, uh, than how would you say, uh, science fiction. So I'm amazed you didn't go for Fight Club. Uh, yeah. Because obviously uh, you contributed to the... the, the yeah, we, did, we helped them with the introduction to Fight Club. But uh, I, I, it was kind of dark and it came out at a dark time. You know, it was delayed in its launch because of the Columbine, uh, you know, mass shooting. And uh, I guess I'm not keen on movies that uh, glorify any form of violence. I'm concerned enough about, how would you say, uh, mankind's tendency to enshrine uh, anything that would be pugilistic. So obviously, for those who don't know, uh, the opening sequence was heavily uh, influenced by uh, by science, by true science. And you were the, the lead consultant. I, I don't know what the right word would be. But this was by, again, by complete luck. I don't think they came looking for you. You were sitting on a plane. Is that correct? Sitting yeah, you've heard me. You've heard me introduce it in a, a lecture. It was. Uh, 
uh, I think it, it was a very specific, uh, I was going to Boston from, I think I, I, I got the, the nonstop from LA. I flew up to LA and hopped on a plane to get to Boston to give a lecture at Harvard. And um, I think I'm certain I had enough uh, miles to upgrade to, to business class or first class or whatever. So I'm sitting on the flight the entire way and uh, being somewhat pressure motivated, I hadn't really put my PowerPoint together until, you know, sitting on the plane, right? Yep. So I'm working on my laptop there on the plane, hoping not to run out of battery uh, the whole time until we land. And as we're landing, I mean, I would usually, you remember the way I tell the story, uh, I was always afraid of getting into conversations with people because they would distract me from what I had set aside as what I was going to accomplish in that three or four hours. Plus, you never know when you're going to get into a conversation with somebody who's polarizing. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so I would always put my noise canceling headphones on and stay quite uh, isolated as best I could. But when you hear the landing gear go down, you can usually, you know, you know, it's a time limited conversation. So I'd put everything away. And the guy next to me says, I see you're into computer graphics, so am I. Uh, what do you do? And I said, well, I, I do brain research. Uh, and he said, well, I, I saw, I'm sorry, I peeked at your computer. I saw a lot of images of you know, uh, neurons and things like that. Uh, and then he revealed that he was from an animation company, uh, Digital Domain, and they had a a job to do for an upcoming movie and that he had just gotten the Academy Award for uh, uh, Titanic. Uh, the guy's name was Mike Canfer. And uh, so I was going, oh, I, you know, four letter word. I probably should have talked to this guy earlier in the flight. I could have <laughs> learned something from him. So we had this animated conversation. We realized that uh, I could help him and uh, that, uh, so we were both on the same flight going home at the end of the day, the next day. So we agreed, I showed him my seat number. He rearranged his seat. We sat next to each other the whole way home. And um, we agreed that I would, uh, when I, once I got home, send him some images and that I would talk to him you know, every week or so as they were trying to put together uh, an animated scene. Now, the part that I thought was most curious is that at that time, I was working very intensively on the key non-neuronal cell, the most abundant cell in the nervous system called the astrocyte. And we had discovered that astrocytes deployed in the brain very differently than had been described for a hundred years. For a hundred years, they'd been described as interdigitating based on seeing the silver staining or the antibody staining for the glial fibrillary acidic protein. The green cells behind me are astrocytes with just that fragmentary staining. But if you were to see them in their entirety, you would realize that each one has a unique territory. They don't interdigitate at all. And we'd made that discovery. So what I was keen to do with this group in Hollywood was to use their resources to make a movie that I could then use to point out this transformative way of seeing the piece parts in the brain. So I kept feeding him information, not only about the neurons, which they wanted, but the astrocytes, which filled in the space, but in a cobblestone way. So I was really keen to get his 90 second video to use it to convince Washington that we should, you know, be able to pursue this funding agencies. So I was very frustrated when they told me that they weren't going to release the movie. They were holding it because of the potential uh, negative feedback they would get because it was to be released right about the time the Columbine uh, shooting uh, happened. And I said, well, I've got to go to Washington. I have to go lecture at the NIH. Can I at least get a copy of the intro sequence so that I can try and use it to pitch? Oh, Professor Ellisman, you're going to be so frustrated because we took all the glia out. We needed a place to put the camera. 
because this starts in the synapse, yeah. right? With exocytosis and pulls back. And in Hollywood, you can show the electrical activity by flashing lights. And so for them, it's a pullback from the fast and fine scale chemistry of a electrical and chemical behavior to the, the full facial of Edward Norton as he's about to pull the trigger and yep. remove Brad Pitt from his brain. Um, so I set out from that point to say, how can I do this on the cheap? They'd spent $6 million for that 90 seconds. And so over a number of years, we figured out how to make animations that were more respectful of the balance of cell types in the brain. Um, so the real I movie, still think it's underappreciated how uh, the non-neuronal cells govern the activity of the neuronal cells. It is a great story, though. Yeah, it was, a, it was a fun thing, and you re you realize uh, how powerful that kind of uh, synthetic graphic is. So uh, we are actually on the hour at the moment, but I, I have to ask you first. Have you got any top tips for anyone starting out today in neurobiology? Um, the, for the, those who, who want to avoid feeling like they're in competition all the time, try and ask questions that are legitimate, but two steps beyond everybody around you. So if you feel that you have have a good idea because you can do somebody else's experiment better. Probably not the best way to approach science. Okay. okay. Ask where people are not and what questions remain deeper and try and pitch at those, even though they might be harder to fund. You're probably going to be happier if you're not feeling like someone's looking over your shoulder competing with you all the time. If you can carve out, uh, questions that are uh, maybe a little bit more adventuresome and ambitious, maybe harder to fund, as I said, but uh, try and avoid the herd. Yeah, more exciting. I, I would say actually, maybe not always more difficult. It can be more exciting. And grant panels like novelty and something more edgy sometimes. I have to ask, I asked earlier on what you wanted to be when you were a boy. You're now no longer a boy. If you could do any job in the world, what would you be? Peter, I have to, I have to uh, think about uh, what other people that I think are more brilliant than me said as they were heading to, you know, uh, infinity or whatever it is. Uh, someone like Einstein who even though I think he took great solace in fiddling with numbers and problem solving in his head. Uh, I think he thought that he probably would have been equally satisfied had he been a cobbler. And my interpretation of that was that there's some satisfaction that comes from the sense of accomplishment, even if it's if, it, if there's some benefit to other people, they can choose, and a sense of accomplishment every time you finish a small job. So uh, how would you say, I, I hope to evolve to feeling satisfied with things that are less grandiose. Uh, so that would be uh, Working in the garage without cutting off my fingers kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I knew you'd come back to that at some point. Mark, thank you very much for joining me today. Everyone who's been watching or listening, thank you. Uh, I strongly recommend very closely associated with this. You've got Jeff Lickman's, you've got uh, Lucy Collinson's, uh, Richard Henderson, who we've talked about earlier. Uh, but even go look at uh, Etch Cell and the work around that as well. And there's, there's some great uh, similar work around this area as well. But Mark, you have been very entertaining <laughs> to talk to. Uh, and I, 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 hope, I hope clean enough, you know. 
<laughs> yes, de 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 definitely. And I, I, I live in fear of saying something that I don't understand that would cancel me. But uh, now, I, I presume you still have got all your fingers, despite talking about being in the garage and losing fingers. Yeah, I, I do have a few cuts and scratches. But... <laughs> You need to get some better YouTube channels to watch how to do that DIY at home. Mark, <laughs> thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for listening to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. To view all audio and video recordings from this series, please visit bitesizebio.com forward slash the microscopists.